This is an avocado. Is it? Yes. This is a banana. Involved in. We got roped into it. Tick tock. Tick tock. They just said they got roped into it. No, true. This is a banana. This is a banana. <laughs> Just give me a second. <laughs> Oh shoot, wait, it's me? Oh, the YouTube video is playing in the background. That's why. Ah, there we go. That's the mystery. There we go. All right. I can just take this YouTube link and copy it and, like, actually myself. And we can start. I'm going to get some props. There we go. Boom. It's not clear how it's probably going to be. It's like our voice are congested into this area. Obviously. Also, um, who is here for the writing issue course thing? So the video is recorded. So you can leave. No, don't don't leave. Just like leave. It's Connor's so awesome. Don't leave. <laughs> but Connor, Connor, there you go. Sweet. Oh, your middle name's Daniel. <laughs> that is correct. That's awkward. <laughs> Facebook shouldn't be telling you. It is. Thank you, Facebook. Um, so maybe we want to get started because I do have to sign off promptly at 6 p.m. Yeah. All right. So you can start right now. Go. Sounds good. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. Uh, you're all uh, UMass students? Yep. Cool. What are uh, are you guys in any specific department or kind of uh, from um, from all around UMass? Engineering. Yeah. <laughs> engineers. Engineers. Yeah. Uh, who show of hands? Who has experience working with EEG? Not many. Anybody? I don't know. I can't see the back of the room. So, okay. How about uh, any type of bio bio tracking, bio signal, bio data? Nothing. Cool. Um, all right. Bunch of noobs. Uh, cool. Well, uh, my name is Connor. I'm co-founder and CEO of OpenBCI. Over here, I'll give you a little camera tour. That's Joel. Joel's my business partner and fellow co-founder. You met him earlier. And there's Irene, who's our resident neuroscientist. She's at the ultra cortex table, or ultra cortex assembly table currently. Um, and these are our 3D printers. And we've got a bunch of other stuff. Um, at any rate, you are you are peering into the Open BCI laboratory. 
uh, workshop, HQ, whatever you want to call it. Um, do you, who all is familiar with the device on my head? A little bit. So this is the Ultra Cortex, the latest version of the Ultra Cortex. It's the Mark III Supernova. Crazy name, I know. Um, it has a 16-channel uh, EEG amplifier embedded into the back. Uh, I'll just show you a different headset. So here's another version. This is the eight-channel version of the board. So this is a open BCI board that can take in uh, eight channels of EEG, EMG, or ECG data. So, uh, similar to an Arduino in the sense that it's programmable. You can uh, change the firmware. You can adjust the settings. You can uh, uh, put in other inputs, so there's a few GPIO pins that you can use for inputs and outputs, so you can add additional sensors. Um, but then it is also extendable into a 16-channel version, so you can put what we call the, the DAISY module uh, onto the board and plug it in so you can double the inputs to 16 channels. Um, yeah, so I guess taking a step back, uh, is everyone familiar with EEG? To a certain degree, so EEG is uh, stands for electroencephalogram, uh, and it is the measurement of electrical signals from the scalp. Uh, and simultaneously, uh, when you're when you're measuring from the head, you also get uh, not just brain data, um, but but muscle data from the muscles around your ears and your eyes, uh, muscles that you use to close your jaw. So when you're wearing a headset like this, you can pick up um, you know, micro expressions from your face. Every time your eye blinks, uh, all of this data can be recorded uh, and very easily seen. And then the the brain data, you have to kind of, uh, it's a little bit, it's a smaller signal, much smaller signal, um, but it's uh, very, in, it's, you know, I, I actually, I personally, I'm just as interested in EMG data, muscle data, as I am EEG data, which is the actual brain activity. Um, but yeah, what I'm gonna do now is actually give you guys a live demo. So what I want to do is share my screen, if I can figure out how to do this. Uh, that's the one. Do, do, do. Share. Cool. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, cool. All right, so this is actually, let me, before I do this, I'm going to take a step back. So this is our website, OpenBCI, and you can see a spinning... 3D model of a head wearing the headset that I'm wearing. Um, and I'll go into more detail about uh, aspects of our website. This is kind of, if, if you want to dig deeper into the platform. But right now what I'm going to do is show you uh, our go-to software. So we have software uh, that we call the OpenBCI GUI. Uh, who here is familiar with um, processing as a development language? So processing is a Java-based creative coding language. Uh, it was developed, I think, by some guys at ITP. MIT. MIT. Okay, MIT, not ITP. Um, and it's it's this kind of really, you know, very open and accessible development language. So we built our software on top of that. And here, let me show it to you. So I'm currently running. So I'm actually plugged in right now. Can you guys see this uh, graphical user interface? Yep. Great. Um, so, do you see the eight channels here? Channels one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? Yep, okay, so those eight channels are mapped onto my head uh, as seen in, in the heat plot over here, the head map. So that little triangle at the front is my nose and these little half ellipses are my ears. So channels one and two are on the front of my head and channels seven and eight, and eight are on the back of my head and, and these are mapped to these channels, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if I start blinking my eyes very rapidly, do you see how the front of my head lights up and all of those bl eye blinks are seen right there? Yeah? Wait, can you, you can't actually see me, can you, anymore? No. All right, so, okay, hang on one sec. Let's see if I can trick the computer. Hmm. Well, whatever. I'm doing these things. Do you see, do you see the eye blinks in, the, in channels one and two? Yeah. yeah. Wink. Yeah, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm blinking both of my eyes rapidly. 
and it's creating those very strong wave artifacts. And now I'm stopping. And now I'm going again. Cool? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grip my jaw. So do you see that huge data, huge all the, that EMG data? <coughs> so that's muscle data as a result of me clenching my teeth. And what you'll notice is that channels three and four produce the strongest signal. If I scale this down, so do you see how channels three and four here are producing the biggest amplitude, uh, scratchy frequency, high frequency wave? And those are visualized in channels three, four here. And that's because if, if you put your hands on the side of your head and you grit your teeth, the muscles responsible for, for using your jaw are on the side of your head and you can actually feel that happen. Um, so now what I want to do is show you some brain waves. So when you close your eyes, you produce, produce an alpha frequency uh, or a, uh, essentially a frequency, a 10 hertz waveform in the back of your head that uh, comes as a result of you kind of relaxing your visual cortex. So your eyes are closed and you're no longer processing tons of visual stimuli. Uh, and as a result, your visual cortex returns to this kind of default frequency. So watch as I close my eyes, look for uh, a 10 hertz frequency. So each of these tall vertical gray lines that separate the EEG montage, that's one second of data. So try to count the number of waves in a second and you'll notice that you'll see about 10 hertz. I'm not doing it yet. Simultaneously, you'll notice that on the, the frequency domain over here on the lower right, just above 10 or maybe about 11 hertz, you'll see the data spike up specifically with the red and brown lines. So I'm about to do it. Now, did you see the waveform here? Yeah. Cool, so I'll do it again just so you can get another look. But as soon as I open my eyes, the, 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 the alpha frequency disappears um, and the spike in the FFT plot drops as well. So I'll do it one more time. Cool, so that's that right there is very good. Um, so I just took a screenshot. Um, but let me come back here now. But um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. Hey, I'm back. Hey, how's it going? So any, any questions on that? Have you ever seen, was that first time seeing EEG and EMG for many of you? Yes. Okay, cool. So... You know, what, what we want to do at OpenBCI is essentially make that data as accessible as possible and get, you know, grad students, PhDs, undergraduates, and maybe even high school students in, in the coming years, uh, getting a better understanding of what, what this biometric data looks like. So uh, having the ability to actually retrieve this data and interact with it in real time. So actually write code that is responding to this data as an input. Uh, and so that is, in many ways, the basis of the OpenBCI platform. It is essentially a toolkit or a prototyping platform for harnessing the electrical data from the human body and using that as a medium to develop around. So what I want to do now is get back into screen sharing. Ooh, let's see. Boom. Share. Um, are we good? Are we back? Great. Um, so now what I want to show you is um, the, okay, so we also have this, I just changed the graph a little bit, but uh, do you see this visualizer here on the upper right? So this visualizer is mapped to channel three, and I'm specifically interested in the amplitude uh, of the data that's coming through that channel averaged over a short period of time. So what I can do is I can grip my jaw, and every time I do it, do you see how I fill the bar up and I basically make the, the red circle and the green circle fill the green circle? Yep, yes, no, okay. So when I do that, I, I'm creating a large EMG artifact that I can then 
uh, use as an input for software or hardware. So I have, we have a different version of the GUI that actually looks at up to 16 channels across the head. Um, and and in, in, in essence, it gives you roughly 16 potentiometers that you, you know, or digital potentiometers that you can trigger with muscle data from your scalp. So what we've done is we've, we've, we've mapped this data into 3D printed robotic hands, uh, RC helicopters, um, musical in instruments. So you're triggering different audio samples based on whether you're blinking your right eye or your left eye or flexing your bicep or your forearm. So the OpenBCI board can also be used not just with the headset, but with uh, other types of electrodes. So you can put some electrodes on your head, some electrodes on your body, and you can be simultaneously measuring brain activity uh, you know, from your visual cortex, your frontal lobe, and then also looking at EMG data from your bicep or EKG, which is muscle data, uh, across, across your chest, uh, and then using all of this data in real time uh, for either research or, or applications. Um, and I'll show you right now. So when I get the command from someone in the audience, just tell me when and I'll drive the bar up. When? All right, tell me again. When? Cool. So now tell me if you want it halfway or, or all the way. And now I'm letting go. So you can see that it's not just uh, push button interactivity. I can actually, with with pretty, you know, minimal training and uh, you know relative ease, I can actually just kind of keep the 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 bar at a mid level, and then when I decide to, I can just drive it all the way up, like that. So you know, I think the implications for this are really profound. I think a lot of times people are very excited about. Uh, the potential, you know, newcomers to the space are really excited about the potential of brain computer interface this or mind control that. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that, you know, we have this wealth of motor data that we still aren't implementing or harnessing. Um, that is actually, you know, a lifetime's worth of our brain training our muscles uh, to behave in a certain way based on brain intention. Um, so don't, my, my only advice to you is don't get uh, blinded by the the sex appeal of of brain computer interfaces when there's a wealth of bio data outside of that that's a lot more practical for many applications. Uh, so just a little food for thought we we're you know we've been interested in helping this individual with ALS for a long time and in our kind of initial research we had a conversation with someone at the uh, ALS Foundation and they said that ninety percent of ALS patients maintain uh, some level of motor function, in other words, muscle control, until they die. So you're, you're looking at a subset of people now who are probably the people who need some type of, you know, bio-computer interface, whether it be brain or muscle, more than anyone else in the world. You know, I would say this group and probably quadriplegics or people with strokes doing stroke recovery. Um, so 90% of this population still has motor function over muscles in their face or their scalp or uh, around their body. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking about designing a practical application for a group of people that need it, uh, don't be blinded by the, the cool and wow factor of BC brain computer interface when this other data is also available. Now, I'm not saying that EEG is not exciting because it is exciting for both interactivity and um, other applications, but um, just definitely keep in mind that there, there is a lot of data. Um, so for with, with, when it comes to EEG, there's a few ways uh, that the data is looked at. One is, is classification in real time. So being able to look at the frequency spectrums, uh, the frequency spectrum and frequency bands in real time and try and essentially reverse engineer them to, to try and understand my brain's intention at any given moment. So one way you can do this is uh, called motor classification or sensory motor uh, classification where you 
actually build an interface and you tell a user or a subject to wear the headset or wear the EEG device and think a certain thought for a period of time. So essentially, um, OK, think about closing your left hand or squeezing your left hand. And we're going to record 30 seconds of data. Now, great, we got that data. Now do the same thing, but with your right hand. And we're going to record 30 more seconds of data. And then you do this over and over and over again. And then you switch the system live, so you have this, these binned data sets. And now you can try and extract features or artifacts from the live data stream that match one of these binned data sets. And if it reaches a certain threshold, you can say, or, or a certain similarity threshold, you can say, OK, the user is most likely trying to trigger their like the, the thought that's correlated with them opening and closing their right hand. So let's trip that switch. So that, in, in, in a nutshell, is kind of a motor classification uh, system. So that's one way of using brain data for interactivity. But there's also um, the EEG can also be used uh, for in more of a passive recording technique for both sleep studies uh, and also looking at something called an event-related potential. Or a P300 is a subset of event-related potentials. Uh, but an event-related potential is essentially exactly what it sounds like. It is your brain's uh, electrical reaction or potential reaction to being presented with a stimuli or an event. So if you are sitting calmly and the expectation of a certain event is there, uh, you know, maybe you are, so for example, one, one example of this is a P300 speller. So if you are trying to spell words, uh, there is an interface that basically uh, has a grid of letters, and I'm going to switch back to me so I can kind of do a visual demo. So here's a P300 interface. The grid is, has all the letters of the alphabet in a two-dimensional array. And there's two lines that are essentially looping over the letters. And so you, as someone with the P300 speller head, head wear on, um, are expecting a, the next letter you want to spell you know, to eventually be uh, targeted by the crosshair of the two lines. The moment that it happens, your brain will elicit a potential which is essentially your brain's way of saying, yay, that's the one. And when that happens, um, the system can, uh, can detect that because the, it'll see a, a large spike in electrical activity. Um, and then the system is able to, to determine or, or to decide, OK, great, the letter T was just you know, targeted, and the, the user wanted that to be spelled. Moving on. Um, and so this is a very slow way of typing. Uh, but in some cases, it's the most effective way of typing for people who have no other means. So, uh, so that's an example of, of using event-related potentials, uh, once again, for interactivity. But I think uh, they're also very interesting to, to think about things like interest and engagement, because uh, there are large ERPs or large potentials that, are, that come as a result of stimuli, but there are also... Um, much smaller versions that are correlated with everyday life and daily events. So, you know, most of the day your, your mind is probably in a mind wandering state where you're kind of searching for the next important thought. Um, and every once in a while something distracts you or catches your attention. And that's associated with a small ERP or a kind of this moment where your brain goes, aha, yeah, let's go there. Um, and so that type of information is really interesting because you actually have this kind of like essentially a metric for interest or engagement as your mind is shifting directions. Um, yeah, any questions at this point? Can you guys all still hear me? Yes. All right, cool. That's good. Um, so yeah, that's, I think with that, I'm going to leave you, uh, that's, I'm going to leave you with that in terms of the science lesson for the day. Um, and I'll let you kind of explore more on your own. But now what I want to do is show you where you can actually go explore more on your own, especially if you want to work with OpenBCI. So this, let me go back to screen sharing. Cool, are we back? All right, great. So this is the OpenBCI website, as I said before. That is not the link I want to be on. Um, this is uh, our Twitter account. So we're pretty active on Twitter. If you want to follow us, we you know post interesting information uh, about what we're doing and also other stuff in the neurotech space. Um, 
we are entirely open source as a company. And so all of the code and hardware that we design, we put on GitHub. So I recommend you checking out the OpenBCI GitHub, many repositories. So for one, a good example is the OpenBCI processing Git repository. So this is where all of the code lives uh, for the, the software that I was just showing you. So you can come in here, tweak any, any of the code, and you can even come here and check out all the other branches uh, here is the audio player. So this is where we use some of the data to, to uh, trip uh, audio samples. This is a, an example where we took the EMG da data from channel uh, three or four, I can't remember, from basically jaw data and mapped it to a new serial port going out to control a 3D printed robotic hand. Um, this is a neuro presentation essentially where we took left and right eye blinks and triggered slides moving forward and backwards and then jaw grits to disengage and engage the presentation and essentially switch between GUI mode or presentation mode. Um, down here we've got a bunch of variants that are using uh, the alpha and something called SSVEP which is a, a data tracked from the back of the head or the visual cortex um, that essentially if you look at a flashing frequency your visual cortex will mimic that frequency and so what we did is we set up an interface where you could look at different frequencies. The, the OpenBCI system would detect the fact that you're looking at a certain frequency, and then we would map those different frequencies to triggers to a robot. So you could control a little hex robot, make it turn left, make it turn right, and walk forward using two different frequencies and then closing your eyes to produce alpha. So all of these uh, OpenBCI processing variants on the, on the GitHub go through different implementations of that. And in general, most of that code that's tweaking, uh, that's tweaking the, the software is in the EEG processing.pde file. Because the EEG processing has a class called EEG processing user. And this is essentially our code, code playground where if we're testing out you know, new interactive features to the GUI or we want to build an EMG visualizer, we build it here first and then when it becomes uh, you know, flushed out enough, we then turn it into a, to its own class um, and then you know, add it to essentially the, the, the default OpenBCI processing GUI. So on top of that, we also have uh, no, or we have a JavaScript SDK, a node module. Um, we have uh, a Python repository where we've got some basic Python uh, getting started code to essentially get the data out of the OpenBCI hardware and into a Python app, uh, and a number of other uh, code repositories. But I'd say the Node.js, the processing, and the Python are, are, are our most developed software packages, and then also all of the firmware that's uploaded to the OpenBCI boards via Arduino uh, is also up here. So here we also have on our GitHub the Ultra Cortex repository. This is where all of the 3D files for 3D printing the headset that I'm wearing, this is where they live. So this is the first, the Mark 1 or the first version, and now we're all the way up to the Mark 3 Nova, which is the one I'm wearing on my head. And here you can see uh, an image of the, the exact headset I'm wearing on my head, actually. And we are currently in development of the Mark IV, which was featured on our recent Kickstarter campaign. And here is the concept image of the Mark IV, though it'll probably look a little bit different when it goes live. Um, so yeah, so another thing I want to show you is the community page. So we've been putting probably more and more effort uh, into the community page recently. But essentially, this is a place, uh, kind of a clearinghouse, where anybody that's working with OpenBCI or interested in OpenBCI can uh, post projects they're working on or research that they're interested in pursuing or events that are coming up. So definitely, uh, you know, if you guys are doing anything neurotechnology related, I recommend just putting an event here and maybe anyone near UMass can find it. I'm not sure, but never know. But definitely, if you're working on projects related to OpenBCI, I... I uh, highly recommend that you post them here and then also reach out to me and let me know and I'll, I'll help you go through the process. But essentially, this is a group WordPress account where you can uh, join or log in if you already have an account. And then once you do, you end up on the people page. 
Uh, and so these are all people who have registered as community members. And uh, every person has a little karma score associated. Uh, so here we've got Chip. He's our electric karma king. He's made the most posts of anyone. And here's his little bio and links to all of the posts he's made. Um, and then the learning page of our website is where we put uh, kind of official tutorials, uh, for instance, the getting started guide, um, uh, tutorials on how to connect the OpenBCI hardware to MATLAB, Neuro OpenVibe, and Neuromore, which are commonly used uh, signal processing software for, for EEG and other biosensing tools. Um, yeah, and so downloads is essentially just kind of a portal to a lot of the stuff that's on GitHub. Uh, the forum is a great place for asking questions. Um, if you're interested in learning what people are doing with OpenBCI and also other EEG and, and related hardware, definitely go to the community page and kind of dig into some of the posts that people have, have created. Uh, and then obviously our store. So this is where we sell gadgets and gizmos for working with OpenBCI. So as you can see, the, for pre-order, uh, we have a number of products from our last Kickstarter campaign. And actually, the Nova and Supernova just went in the store today. So they are uh, the latest revision of the Mark III or the third version of the headset. Uh, and then we've got our, our, our boards here, which are kind of the, the microcontrollers that we use uh, for actually acquiring the data. And these plug into all of our headsets. Um, yeah, and here, if, you've, you know, if you're interested in kind of learning about the history of OpenBCI, you can check out both of our Kickstarter campaigns. So we were funded on Kickstarter twice. So we, we ran a successful Kickstarter in late 2013, and then we just ran another one uh, in late 2015, which we are still in the process of fulfilling and hope to finish fulfilling by the end of the summer. Uh, yeah, and so that is pretty much OpenBCI in a nutshell. Um, so I'm going to bring it back to back to face to face, but do you guys, uh, uh, have any questions before we wrap it up? So you said the headsets are all 3d printed. Yeah. So, um, we offer, uh, we offer print it yourself kits, but you know, if you really dig in, you can source all of the components yourself. Uh, and if you have access to 3d printers, you can, um, Pretty much 3D print, uh, I would say the majority of the headset, at least the structure, the mechanical parts, uh, so that there's little nodes. Uh, the majority of the actual volume of the headset is 3D printed, and then we sell uh, electrodes and wires and the embedded electronics to make the headset function. And then if you are too lazy to print your own headset, we sell a fully assembled or an unassembled version of the headset as well. <clears throat> Any other questions? Um, so, what is it? What is it called? The event-related. Oh, e yeah, ERP or event-related potential. Can, can like you record someone's brain, like someone's EEG or EMG, like e response to something, and then like have someone else use use that to like use one person's data, would that correspond to like someone else like trying to control, like, do you know what I'm, like would it, could you use one person's like, uh, I don't know, like what, whatever, whatever task you're trying to train. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Are you, so is, is a training, is a trained data set transferable between people? Yeah, like generally. Not really. I mean, so yes, and I mean, I would say that if you were training a system or a classifier, you would most likely target the same regions of the brain on a given person, though not necessarily. Um, but if you were implementing or kind of engaging, uh, for instance, a motor, motor cortex uh, interactivity system, you would have to retrain the system for a new individual. Uh, like it would, it would almost definitely not work if you took the headset off someone and put it on someone else. Yeah. 
Well, it would be like kind of mm -hmm. You at least would need some level of calibration where you're, you kind of know what you're looking for on the new subject, but you still have to train that data set. Right. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, yep. Like, how does it like determine like where all the electrodes are? Or is it like, is it like getting brain data from all of the brain or just certain parts of it? So there's something called the 1020 system, which is a, a uh, essentially a internationally accepted map for placing oh. electrodes in the context of EEG. So it's literally just like number 10-20 system. Um, and so this map is what we use for uh, establishing the node network of our headsets. And then if you, you know, for instance, this node here is FPZ, and then the middle is CZ, and then the back of the head is OZ, and then there's a numbering and lettering system to uh, relay information like, oh, I was, you know, I had my electrodes on C3, C4. If you said that to someone else working in EEG, they would know where to place the electrodes to replicate the experiment. You said that um that like using the muscle data is more practical in a lot of applications, but like I'm wondering why that is because you have a you have like a fairly large amount of data that you can get from the EEG. So especially with somebody who can with ALS who can like only move part of their cheek or something, what like like why is it that you get you know um, get more useful data? Just like looking at the pulse of that muscle rather than something something in the brain. Like, is there issues with like resolution or like readability or something? I mean, it's just for one, brain data is teeny tiny in terms of power relative to uh, muscle com data coming out of a muscle. So you're talking like microvolts, uh, you know, you know, one to ten microvolts as opposed to a hundred or two hundred microvolts from, uh, or maybe even more from from muscle data. Uh, so just the, the strength of the signal is much smaller. And then you've also got all of that data has to, has to get through uh, skull, skin, sweat, hair. Uh, so the, you know, the, elect the actual electricity or the electrons actually have to flow through uh, you know, substantially more material, which creates noise and dissipation of the signal. Uh, so you, know, you're just, you have many more obstacles in terms of getting a clear signal. If you're recording EEG, then you do muscle, because muscle the only barrier barrier is skin, uh, and the signal is much stronger. So uh, there's that, and then there's also the fact that you know your muscles is essentially this kind of like biomechanical amplifier of brain data that's being sent through your nervous system. So your brain is the source; it's kind of processing information that it's receiving and then translating that into movement or action. Um, but your muscle, you know, is at the end, it's kind of the, the furthest extension of your nervous system and it is literally burning calories to amplify electricity to generate movement. So the signal is, is, is significantly stronger than something that you're recording from the head. And it's also, you know, the intention of the signal. So when you're flexing your muscle, uh, the only reason that electricity is there is because your brain told it to be there. Whereas your brain is like this ocean of all of this stuff going on at the same time, uh, you know, vision, hearing, uh, you know, language, uh, you know, everything that could actually be possibly conceived by consciousness. So it's just a, a much more complex signal. So, you know, for, for interactivity and for kind of uh, uh, getting the response that you're anticipating, Targeting a muscle with an electrode is a much more effective way of getting uh, a one-to-one -one mapping of intention and output. Um, I have a question. When you were creating this, you know, open BCI board, what was the most challenging part in the whole process? What was the one thing, or if there was one thing that really stood out when you were trying to build it? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I really think it's all been difficult, but fun. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, that's really kind of too hard. To, there have been many difficult things. I think some of the most stress, stressful or frustrating 
parts of the whole experience were uh, Kickstarter fulfillment. So if you're ever thinking about running a crowdfunding campaign, just make sure uh, that you don't bite off more than you can chew because I think it's really easy during crowdfunding to promise more than you can deliver uh, because you're in you're kind of in the spotlight and you feel like you have this limited amount of time to to tell the world what you're capable of and then you end up maybe uh, taking risks that you shouldn't and I think uh, we did a pretty good job of not biting off more than we could chew but I think uh, you know we definitely had our hands full after the first Kickstarter campaign and I like to think this time around we're a little bit better uh, primed to deliver on time uh, so definitely you know like you know if you're ever gonna run a crowdfunding campaign for one make sure that you budget uh, the value of your own time. You know, make sure that you're paying yourself to actually do the work. You know, like I guess the first first uh, suggestion would be like respect your own time and don't don't turn yourself into an accidental charity. Um, and then two, you know, make sure that you're not making false claims about what you're actually capable of building. Because then you're just going to end up in a really stressful place. I'm not saying we did that, I but I think. Uh, there was fear of that at times, and then we ended up kind of pulling through. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, what other like obvious, like uh, basic EEG like signals besides the alpha ten hertz signal? Like, is there anything else that like is like really simple to produce? So, yes and no. I mean the. Alpha is by far the easiest brainwave to just kind of like consciously turn on because all you have to do is close your eyes in most cases. Uh, if you've if you've drank, you know, if you've had coffee recently, sometimes it's harder to produce alpha. Um, so if you if your mind is kind of stimulated, it's a little bit harder. But I drink a lot of coffee, so I think at this point I can just always produce alpha. Uh, <laughs> but the you know if you're if you're falling into sleep or if you're in deep sleep, your brain is producing delta or theta, uh, which is kind of a lower frequency, higher amplitude wave. Uh, some people who are experienced and who have, who have trained with neurofeedback systems can actually just engage and disengage various frequencies on command without closing their eyes. So we had, a, we had someone come into the, the lab uh, a few weeks ago uh, who, is, who runs a neurofeedback clinic for for helping people with ADHD and things like that. And, uh, you know, it was evident that he had trained a lot. And I was like, hey, can you, uh, we put the headset on him and he was like, oh, this is great. This is really easy. Um, but I was basically like, hey, can you, can you produce alpha with your eyes open? Because this is something I've been trying to do for a while, like basically train myself to not have to close my eyes to produce alpha. And he was like, yeah, let me, let me see. You know, it's been a while. And in two seconds, every single channel was alpha like all eight channels on his head, like in, in like almost instantly. I was just like, I was blown away um, because like normally when I close my eyes, I only produce alpha in the back of my head, you know, one place. And he basically went boom, all on. Um, and he was saying how, you know, he can train himself because uh, there's, there's certain conditions that are associated with imbalances in frequencies between hemispheres and things like that. And he was saying that when he trains, he trains to have, he basically tries to increase his alpha frequency. So he says naturally he has a low, a low alpha frequency, meaning, you know, around nine hertz. Because alpha to, from person to person or from moment to moment can actually vary between eight and twelve hertz. So he he was like, yeah, you know, when I'm not trying or when I'm kind of like, uh, you know, just going about my business, my alpha is around eight or nine hertz. But um, I want it to be higher, and I forget why he said. I think maybe like the the average human bell curve puts the median human at around ten hertz. And I guess like if you have a higher frequency alpha, you're more alert or more attentive during the day. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but he was like, "Yeah, I want to train this on a regular basis." But that being said, he could just turn on and off alpha on command, which was really impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Well, thank you for speaking today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you again.
Thank you everyone for coming in. If you want to take a few cookies on your way out, that'd be good. And I'll have a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> Only avocados and bananas for you. All right, I'll eat my banana. But thank you again for um, presenting, and I hope you enjoyed this. All right, thank you. Feel free to reach out if you've got follow-up questions, anyone. So Yeah. Um, I'll send this information as well. If anyone can sign in there, who has, that'd be great. But sweet. Cool. Right. Thank you very much. Take Hope care. You have a good rest of your day. You too.